Uh, and so in, in researching and studying with New Testament scholars, what I read and learned was the Gospels really were less focused on marriage and describing it and more so in how we are to interact with one another as the people of God. Jesus did have some thoughts on marriage, and if you want to research more about that, um, Mark chapter 10 has some information about Jesus' opinions about marriage and divorce. Here's a little interesting tidbit I found. Adultery. Big no-no, right? Big no-no, Jesus. They're stoning her, the woman caught in adultery. He tries to calm everybody down. It's not saying it's okay, she's been doing this, but let's not kill her. Adultery was only for women. Men could have as many sex partners as they wanted. That's not something we know about from the Gospels, right? But New Testament scholars said it was only if a woman had sex with more than one person. Men could have as many as they wanted. So women had to be very careful. And if they were caught, they were killed. That was just the law of the land uh, in Jesus' time. So, speaking of as many sex partners as you'd like, polygamy was very common and actually a, a high society ideal for men in the Old Testament. Uh, this, again, fascinated me. Um, I have for you um, how many wives some of our leaders from the Old Testament have. And you can look through them and see. Um, Lamech, Esau, Jacob, Asher, Gideon. Look at Solomon. 700. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so it now it leads to, and again, I mean, we're talking about marriage here, but we're also talking about the evolution of what marriage was. An alliance to gain land or to gain status, right? That's what it was. It wasn't like, oh, you're cute, let's get married. It was, yeah, this is my daughter, and, you know, I'm going to match you up because it's a good match. There was no dating, there was no courting, there was no, oh, I like you. It was all about political alliances and patriarchal society. So, what was the role of women? They were property. They were given to make stronger alliances between tribes and countries. Uh, women were to produce male heirs. They could be thrown away if they could not conceive. They could be killed. They could be thrown out in the wilderness. Uh, their whole role was to develop, excuse me, to produce male heirs. Women were also concubines and female slaves, and they were completely available to men. Hence Solomon and his 700 partners and wives. They could take uh, wives that were of, of great status, and they could also take slaves as wives, as men chose to. Um, so I thought that was something just important to see as we look at the evolution of the beginning of what a marriage was, a contract, to how it's gotten to where it is today. Some other things to note, in fact, I think this came up last week. Someone was talking about incest and marrying relatives. Um, back in the olden days, biblical forefathers married their relatives. Isaac and Jacob had cousins that were wives. Abraham had a half-sister who was his wife. Cousin marriages are still acceptable in some societies today. Uh, and incest is still alive and well in some of the royal families across the globe. And the idea there is they don't want you to marry below your ranking or status. Now, of course, that's not true in America. But just be aware that <coughs> still happens even today. Let's see. Oh, I also, also found this was an interesting tip. This is probably not new to you, but I thought it was interesting. The women in the Old Testament were homebound always on the authority of a father, a brother, or a husband. They were in charge of the domestic labor. They were not allowed to speak or appear in public without a male escort, and they had their heads covered. What does that sound like to you today? Conservative, strict Islam. So that's not a new thing, even though we're, as Americans, pretty repulsed by it. That was happening long ago as well. So women, for a long time, had no voice, no right. They simply were property. Aren't we glad we live today, ladies? Yes, we are. Okay, so we're going to go on now to the evolution of character of marriage throughout the world. So we've already talked a little bit about uh, arranged alliances, the whole power and land. Uh, I want to tell you some of the interesting um, tidbits I found out. 
this book. I, I brought some books with me that I read, and I'd love for you to look at them, but um, you're welcome to borrow them. In ancient Egypt, the bloodlines had to be pure. So arranged alliances were all about making sure you were of the right uh, family. In ancient Rome, women were considered currency that they just doled out. In ancient Greece, women were only used to produce legitimate heirs. Ah, this was another interesting tidbit. This is in Greece. Uh, in arranged alliances, women were not to be affectionate with their husbands. Men and women took on other partners in general if they wanted to have intimate, um, affectionate needs met. So a wife was really just there to produce the child. So all these other um, relationships that were had with both male and female at this time in Greece were for the affection, the tenderness, and the love. And that leads us into worldwide polygamy. Yet another evolutionary movement that aren't we glad is uh, not a Western tradition today. Um, in ancient Greece and Rome, it was acceptable and expected for men to have multiple uh, lovers. And there is noted that there was an emperor who not only had a wife, but he also had um, a male athlete whom he loved and chose to bring into his court as uh, a husband. Uh, in India, here is an interesting tidbit, women take on multiple husbands and their husbands' brothers as their husbands. Uh, in the Inuit and Arctic cultures, there are co-marriages where two couples cohabitate and share freely uh, their bodies with one another. In South America, there are women who, when they are pregnant, take on as many lovers as they want, and those lovers later then have a responsibility to raise the child. <laughs> <laughs> Polygamy at its finest. Um, I also thought this was interesting. Um, in the Native American people, there are um, a tribe called the Crows. They believe that there are three uh, genders of people, male, female, and then a burdosh. And a burdosh is a person who has both male and female spirits inside of them, and burdosh people are allowed to marry each other. The Native American culture, and I thought, wow, so they've kind of had this figured out for a while. Uh, in some Native American, Asian, and African societies, same sex marriages are acceptable as long as the partners take on the role of the opposite gender so that all the duties in a household are covered. Hmm. So we go all the way back to the idea that we're all made and we all have different ways that we are equipped with strength and power and we are to be partners in life. And here in some societies, Native American, Asian, African societies in particular, Marriages are acceptable of same gender as long as they take on different roles. Uh, and then this one I thought was really unbelievable, and it is now outlawed today, but I thought it was worth mentioning. In China, women are married off to dead single male relatives so that the dead relatives aren't lonely. They're called ghost marriages. They're outlawed today, but still an interesting thing about the evolution of marriage. Okay, now let's move to divorce. Uh, divorce is something that is acceptable in some societies, cultures, religious traditions. Actually, in the Jewish tradition, uh, it is not frowned upon the way it has been in early Christian uh, society. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, you are looking for your soulmate, and if that soulmate doesn't work out, it is fine to have a divorce and then go find the second partner who then obviously probably is your soulmate. Um, but where divorce became the most unacceptable was first in the Middle East and also in early Christianity. And as we all know, that was the big argument between um, the church and the state and Henry VIII, kind of our biggest example of that. Another early Christian thought, and now moving on to number five, is that really honestly, celibacy is best. This is from early Christianity. Sex distracts you from God. If you cannot contain your urge to have sex, then marriage is a good idea. Christians of the Middle Ages did not believe that love in a marriage was possible. It was too erotic. It gave too much pleasure. Thus, it distracted from God. And here is a quote from one of the theologians. Early Christian thought was that rigorous self-control was needed to obtain spiritual salvation. So, the thought was, well, if you can't contain yourself, then go find a wife or a husband. But the thought was that that was a sexual pleasure 
and not the intimate pleasure that we all see as integrated part of sexual relations today. So when did monogamy become the thing? Uh, in the sixth and ninth, through the sixth and ninth centuries, um, Western tradition started to begin the idea of monogamy. So polygamy is out, and of course we have Mormons today that still practice polygamy, but that's very rare, obviously, in Western tradition that that's acceptable. Monogamy became the way that was seen as one man, one woman, together. Uh, but it's still um, only under arranged marriages from the 6th through 9th century. There's no attraction or love as part of the process. Marriage is about an arranged uh, decision between parents who are choosing the partner on behalf of their child. And then in the 9th century, um, obviously the battle uh, with the church and state started to take over. And um, that's where we see a lot of the royalty who are splitting away from the Roman Catholic Church at the time. Um, in 1563, the very first um, decree was made by the Roman Catholic Church, 1563, that marriage was to be a sacred ritual performed in church. So up until 1563, it was more a civil contract. We're just trying to wrap our heads remember about the evolution of marriage here. So in 1563, it's the first statement of the church that it's a sacred ritual to be form, performed in church. So then we move into, well, what, what's going on in the United States? In 1639, oh, everybody wave. <laughs> Entertainment for our video. Um, civil marriage licenses started to be given out in 1639. That was the very first a uh, civil marriage contract that was expected in the United States. So before that, and many of you know more about this than I do, uh, the common law, wives and husbands, were really more of what was happening. Now it is required in the United States in 1639 that these um, marriages and licenses be printed on paper. And now, of course, we're all thankful to have those pieces of paper when we need them for certain reasons. Then we get to the 1700s and the Enlightenment. Western societies began to hear from young adults that they did not want arranged marriages anymore. They wanted to marry for love. And here was the newspaper outcry. Quote, ready? 1700s, the Enlightenment, they want to marry for love. Here's the quote. You are ruining the institution of marriage. You are allowing the wrong people to marry. 1700s, the Enlightenment. Okay, then we go to the Victorian era. 1837 to 1901. In the Victorian era, there was a movement that good wives must be in the cult of purity. They must be checked for virginity, and they must wear virginal white like Queen Victoria. They are to appear asexual, and they are not to have a libido, they are not to be lusty, and they are not to enjoy sex. So, now we have the swing. Once you get to choose your own partner from the Enlightenment, you gotta not enjoy it. <laughs> so, to repress lust among partners, prostitutes became a way that men were able to enjoy lusty sex. Can you all believe I'm talking about this? <laughs> okay, so then we get to the 1900s, where the movement and progression in marriage is that you are to have sexual satisfaction with your spouse. So um, Western societies in particular have been the most progressive about realizing what well, we've come a long way from alliances and arranged marriages and um, you know not getting to see your partner and spouse until the wedding night to you should be able to uh, have enjoyment and fulfillment of sexual relations with your, your spouse. So then we get to the now we're really moving into um, Western culture here. The 1950s, we see the big boom with nuclear families, World War II era. We have husband as breadwinner, wife stays home, minds the children, cooks and cleans in heels and pearls. Um, however, even though we have a movement towards at least you're with someone you care about, there are still laws against interracial marriage of white people too. Here's the list. Blacks, Mongolians, Hindus, Indians, Japanese, Chinese, and Filipinos. That was in the 1950s. Not so long ago. That one is going to. Another evolution of 
marriage. 1960s and 70s, we have the feminist groups who are voicing their concerns and questions as to why marriage is not a partnership. 1960s and 70s, I was born in 1972. I'm really thankful this was taken care of. Could not have your own credit card in your own name. Some of you probably remember some of this. Your vows included you had to obey your husband. Uh, you had no rights, ladies, to your legal property if you chose to divorce. Um, and marital rape was not marital rape. That actually uh, changed in um, 1967. So that's again an evolution of where marriage has come and gone uh, from long ago. One other thing I wanted to tell you, but I can't remember where it fit in context. Um, so where do I stand on this? Um, I'm a 21st century Presbyterian female minister. I grew up in a family where I was never told I couldn't do something because I was a woman. In fact, I was told I could do anything I wanted. And I did just that. And I'm thankful for that. I was raised by a stepfather who loved me like my, he, I was his own. Uh, I'm very thankful my mom left my biological father because he was unhealthy. And she did not want us to be harmed. So I'm thankful that divorce was okay. I'm thankful that I have a stepfather who loved me. Uh, I'm thankful that I am uh, able to do what I want to do with my life as a woman. And when I study all of this and I read about this, I go back to the understanding that everything is to be taken in context. We look at the history, we look at the evolution of marriage, we look at the context in which people uh, are treated well, treated as partners, uh, treated with care. And I love studying the Hebrew scriptures, especially when we look at what God intended for us, which was that we are to have love and care for one another, to work together for God's good creation. Uh, and the fact that there are other things that Sid's going to cover next week in the scriptures about um, the homosexual issue and whether or not the partnerships are to be recognized as marriages, um, all I can say is that I think that uh, Jesus called us to love one another. And that commandment for me kind of wipes out all the rest of the, the ways in which we've harmed each other and oppressed each other uh, and have also uh, ostracized one another. I don't think that was ever God's intent for any of us. So, I've given you some food for thought, and with terrifying intrepidation, I'll try and answer questions. <laughs> But I did. The books that are on the back of your handout are all up here. If you want to look at them, just don't take one from me unless you let me know. Questions? Hi. This will be easy. <laughs> um, last Sunday, I had lunch with my parents, and we talked a little bit about how to class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do the over. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, last Sunday, I had lunch with my parents, and we chatted about the uh, proceedings of this class. And they went home and did a little reading and discovered a letter that she presented, or I guess a statement that he made at this session. I'm not 100% clear what the context of the letter was, but it really spoke to them. And maybe you wouldn't mind sharing your um, family's oh. experience. Okay, uh, sure. What Todd's referring to is when the session began to study uh, what Sid has shared with us about the upcoming decisions that were made with our session. We were asked each, Neil, Sid, Neil, Sid and I, to uh, make statements of our own about our opinions on the matter. And uh, Sid so amazingly and eloquently stated what I believed that I really just wanted to say, ditto, and you know, let him his statement stand. But it was important that each of us make a statement. And so I took some time to share my story about growing up uh, in New Orleans in the 80s with, um, in a blended family. And my uncle, who was at Tulane Medical School, uh, realized that he was gay. And he was really struggling with it. And I grew up in a very uh, Southern uh, family that believed in traditional values. And uh, he had two older brothers who were very masculine, very um, intense, and he was afraid to 
share with his family, my grandparents and my uncles, um, this information. And so he went to my mom, who was the only girl in the siblings, and uh, also because we lived in New Orleans, he came over a lot to do laundry and watch Bugs Bunny. <laughs> I was very good at memory watching Bugs Bunny with him. And he told my mom that he was gay and he was afraid to be honest with our family. And from that day um, on, all my mother taught us was to love him, that he was made in the image of God, that he was our uncle, that his her brother, uh, and that there was nothing to be afraid of, there was nothing to 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 be repulsed by, that this was part of this, this is a person in our family, and to love him. And I think her modeling that for us actually over um, I would say 15 to 20 years modeled acceptance among my very traditional family, not just my grandparents, but my uncles and their children, who took a long time to love Alan just as God had made him. So there was a lot more in that paper than that, but that I think was the essence of it. So for me, um, I, I don't know that I've had um, the journey that some others have had. Uh, because my uncle Alan is one of my favorite people. And I do believe we are all made in the image of God, even with all of our differences, whether they're learning differences or physical differences. Uh, God doesn't make junk. We tell our youth that because they're having self-esteem issues. God makes us all. One aspect of the marriage and the gay community that may not be addressed is the fact that a lot of times... I think I just broke the microphone. <laughs> One aspect in the gay community where it comes to marriage, civil marriage, is that frequently a company that you work for requires for insurance purposes and so forth <laughs> that there be a civil marriage. And so I think that frequently the marriage takes place simply to cover that aspect. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very good point, and I, um, I'll i be honest with you, I, I did not look up a lot about the state of civil marriages to teach that to you today. One, because I felt like I was going to get in way over my head with law things, but also because I got so excited about reading and studying this, I felt like this might be a better use of my time. But I think your point's well taken.